Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 115 of Level Up, 60 minutes of live Q&A, where your questions drive the show. Adriana and Shanice today are in the chat, so do please let them know your name and, of course, the city from where you're joining. We're going to post a link into the chat so that you can vote up the questions that you would most like answered by the panel and, of course, for you to be able to add your own. If your question selected, then your name's going to appear in the credits at the end of the show. So do get your questions in early and stay with us to see all of that happen. Today, we're going to be talking about how to build a service culture in your organization, something that people have strived for for many years, don't always fully achieve. And it's quite fascinating, isn't it, how functionally how we organize ourselves can sometimes mean that it becomes incredibly difficult to break through that kind of stovepipe or siloed way of thinking in order to be able to drive truly transformational cultural change. Now, to discuss the topic, we've got a fantastic panel joining us today. So let's jump straight in and meet them all. Marlene Jagnesh, of course, um, you will remember she's a highly experienced business relationship manager who specializes in nurturing high performance BRMs and their teams. Always positive, Marlene enriches her clients with her experience from both the public and the private sectors. Welcome back to Level Up, Marlene. Lovely to see you again. Likewise, Nick, uh, I'm delighted to be here with my fellow panelists, uh, and I'm looking forward to all the wonderful questions that we are going to get from around the world. Uh, I'm always impressed by uh, the wide reach of, of, le of the Level Up audience. So looking forward to this show. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Adin. We're already seeing folks uh, joining us from the Middle East and from the UK and also from Australia as well. So lovely to have all of them online and um, great to have you here as well, representing the fine city of Melbourne um, in the springtime. So lovely to have you join us, Marlene. Diane Rampadarath is, of course, the Assistant Director of Public Service of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, where she focuses on the delivery of sustainable development projects into rural communities. Um, a regular contributor now to Level Up, Diane shares her um, first-hand experience of how you get people to work together around an aligned theme to deliver value back to citizens. Diane, welcome back to Level Up. Thank you, Nick, and ABMG International, again, for the opportunity to appear on Level Up and to discuss this very important topic. So in our rapidly global changing economy, in order to maintain a sustainable competitive advantage, you need to have good customer service and a good service culture. I'm looking forward to a very interesting show. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And it's those moments of truth, isn't it, for all of us when we experience a service firsthand that either make or break the relationship as a client. So um, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, today, we're delighted to welcome Matt Crabtree for the first time to Level Up. He is, of course, the founder and principal partner of the consulting organisation called Positive Momentum, a, a clearly very well titled consulting organization because Matt is always positive and progressive. He works with organizations that really do want to commit to kind of shake up the way in which they work and do things. And um, he is, of course, a very accomplished coach and mentor and co-authored the professional services, professional certification scheme. So welcome to Level Up, Matt. Lovely to see you. Nick, thank you very much. What a, uh, a privilege to be here and what a brilliant subject um, for um, the times we are in, right? I think our, all of our expectations of service have gone up dramatically um, in the last 10, 20 years, um, led not least by um, many incredible consumer companies, some of whom I suspect we'll discuss over the next uh, hour or so. But yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. You're so right. You know, people's expectations are evolving um, really, really quickly. And they see good service, they like it, they recognize it. And then suddenly that is the benchmark for all of us to be able to aspire to and to achieve. So thank you and welcome to the show. Mark Rovers completes our panel for today. He is, of course, president over at Interprom, where he has led both the US and uh, European teams to deliver a range of coaching, training and consulting services in the fields of service management, of course, and business relationship management as well. So welcome back to the panel, Mark. Lovely to see you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for having me. Thank you, APMG. Uh, great to be back. It's a um, topic that's near and dear to me, service culture. It's something that um, actually I got really hooked on also because of a book uh, that I, uh, I'm going to recommend during this show from uh, Ron Kaufman, Uplifting Service. And um, actually, one of the takeaways was that the levels of service is the highest level, he said, was an unbelievable service. And the lowest one was a criminal service. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Well, that is a very clear guidance, isn't it? I think I know already where I would like to aspire to get to. Okay. Um, so very good. So thank you very much indeed, Martin. What's fascinating about this panel, everybody, is that we have all been involved in delivering real programs to achieve service improvement. So do bear that in mind, okay, as we begin to answer your question. So if you've got a real question, you know, about work that you're doing or something that you're trying to figure out, you know, please do just type it into the chat and we'll get it in front of the panel as quickly as we can. Now then, um, Completing our group for today is, of course, our question master, Charlotte Miller, who I think is joining us from Yorkshire uh, here in the UK. Um, how was your weekend, Charlotte? It was, I was going to say fantastic, but I got absolutely caked in mud because it's so wet up here still and dog walking and rain and, and it just doesn't happen, does it? You just end up filthy. Anyway, yeah, it's good. Thank All you very right. much, Nick. Okay. Well, um, it's, just, it's a very... Very British tradition, I think, to say that there's no wrong type of weather, there's only the wrong type of clothing. So that's how we kind of cope with it here. But um, nonetheless, all right, very good. So Charlotte, if we can, um, we've got a huge number of people online already. So uh, welcome everybody who's joined in to, who's tuned in rather, to see us both on LinkedIn and on YouTube. So let's jump straight in if we can, and we'll take our first question for the day. Thanks, Nick. Question from Henry. Who is responsible for developing service culture in a company? Does this sit with leadership? All right. Okay. So who is responsible? Um, Marlene, why don't you start us off? Then we'll hear from Diane. Uh, Henry, thank you for such a great question to, to get us started. I believe um, culture is something that is co-created. It's not the responsibility of a single individual or cohort. And different players have different roles to play uh, in this co-creation space. So uh, the leadership, people in leadership positions have to set the vision, uh, you know, demonstrate their commitment. But in, in shaping out how that culture manifests itself in our day-to-day -day practice, it's a responsibility of all the employees that are involved in designing and delivering services. To some extent, we might even say that our customers are also uh, involved in co-creating a service culture along with us. Mm, that's very interesting, isn't it? And I think we might come back to you on that in a, in a few minutes. Let's go to Diane next, and then we'll hear from Matt. Yes, I also agree with Malini, what Malini said, and also to contribute that officers at the C-level or the C-suite who can include the CEO and the chief operating officers can also contribute to the service culture because they can define the culture and through their leadership strategies and goals can actually cultivate it as well. Okay, thank you very much, Diane. So important. Um, Matt, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I spent most of my time um, with senior execs these days. And my answer to the question, Henry, would be absolutely and indisputably. And I, I entirely am anxious about this being my first answer to my first question on Level Up. I don't want to disagree with my fellow panelists, but I think without the executive believing that a service culture is important, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. Um, you can have wonderfully engaged middle management communities. I've seen it in organizations where middle managers have felt very passionate about establishing a service culture, but where the executive have just not been evident and tangible in the way that they believe service culture should be manifested, and frankly themselves have not particularly demonstrated service culture behaviours. So I think without it at the top, it's a fool's errand for everybody else. It's just a waste of time for everybody else. The executive have a massive, massive responsibility. These days, often driven by regulators, so in industries like financial services, 
um, regulators put in place very specific expectations of service culture. So there are industries where it's totally unavoidable um, for executives. But I, I think re- repeatedly, what I've seen where the executive is brought in, the rest of the organisation has a much, much easier time of it. Yeah, it's such a good point, isn't it, to think about what is that mix, if you like, that's going to produce the desired outcome. And, you know, cultures are rarely, it's very difficult in my experience to be able to get a culture to stand still. It's always moving one way or another. Now, whether that's a positive or a negative trend, um, (laughs) it's a different matter. But it's very, very difficult to get a culture to actually stand still and crystallise. Mark, what are your thoughts on this, please? I fully agree with uh, Matt about it needs to start with executive leadership and maybe with the help of uh, defining some core values, uh, three, five, seven core values to uh, evolve culture. I wouldn't call it a co-create culture. I would say evolve culture as a whole, but it needs to start with executive management. Okay, so um, so here's a supplementary question then, panel, to this really. So I, I think the questioner is asking who's responsible, which is fine, but we've got this peculiar link here, don't we, where we have every individual contributor, every line manager, every middle manager in the organisation and the C-suite all needing to work together. So what are the traits that you would look for from leadership in these circumstances, given that it is a shared endeavour? What are the sorts of behaviours that you would like to see? Mark, start us off. Definitely to be a role model in anything and everything they say and do. Thank you very much. Just kind of live the culture and and be that leading light. Uh, Matt, your thoughts? Get to the front line of the business. Sit in service centres, put a set of headphones on, get out into branches if they've got them, into the manufacturing centres, anywhere where the organisation either comes into contact with customers or indeed internal customers where there are handoffs and interfaces between different divisions. Those are the places where leadership are going to really find out the truth in a boardroom with a flip chart you can you know they're not going to be able to work it out there go and see it for real is my advice it's certainly it's certainly really good i was told very early on in my career that management by walking about was a really good trait to be able to kind of pick up go and see people sit where they sit you know listen to the conversations that they have to have you know on a day-to-day basis because it does give you that unique insight marlene what traits and behaviors would you like to see uh i actually I'm really liking the direction this conversation is taking because, you know, it looks on the surface, it looks as though we are presenting different views. But I think we're all saying the same thing, that that people in leadership positions actually have a a really key responsibility for developing service culture. And I agree um, that they need to be visible and they actually need to go where the rubber hits the road. What I also want to draw attention to is uh, traits, leadership traits. Uh, across the organization because, uh, you know, Henry's question does this sit with leadership. You could interpret this as not just being about people in very senior leadership roles. It could also be about people across the organization that have potential to take uh, a leadership role in this. Um, And I think, uh, you know, in, in this day and age when we're talking about distributed leadership, certainly culture is something that, um, everyone in the organization should take ownership for. Okay. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Uh, Diane, final thoughts on this before we move on. Sure. You can have a leader who drives and promotes the value and culture of the organization in every aspect. So, for example, at a board meeting and even at a lower level, for example, an orientation program where you have new employees coming into the organization, it can be much more effective if your C-level or C-suite executives can actually speak to them and let them know what the belief and value of the organization is. Yeah, I would, I would completely agree with that. You know, the, one of the challenges of my not being in a leadership position is that you are by definition one or more steps removed from the day-to-day activity and you're relying on kind of working through other people to achieve results rather than necessarily, you know, doing it yourself. So from that perspective, you know, being able to be, I, I would say, authentic and just acknowledge 
that you can often take three steps forward, followed by several steps in the opposite direction in order to be able to bring about cultural change. That's quite normal. It's quite normal and quite natural. It's not a linear progression from state A to state B on, and then onwards. You know? It's often something which is uh, impacted by circumstances, by um, ex- external as well as internal pressures. And be resilient, you know, be prepared to uh, take stock from time to time and say to everybody, well, we tried this. <laughs> you know, it's actually proving a lot harder than we thought, but we're determined, you know, we are going to see it through and let's figure out a way, you know, getting around whatever those roadblocks happen to be. So really good. What a fantastic first question to kind of get us going. And um, thank you so much for that. Thank you, panel, for your insight and sharing your ideas. Charlotte, um, uh, I do think we've got an amazing audience now online. So I'm going to just have a shout out to them to get your questions in early, please because we've got questions stacking up already in Slido. Um, Charlotte, on that note, let's take our next question, please. Thanks, Nick. We've got a question from Ramona. How can we encourage open feedback from our clients without sending a feedback survey? Mm, it's a good point, isn't it? Surveys, surveys, surveys are often the way in which we gather um, information. Um, Mart, why don't you start us off? Then we'll hear from Diane. I think if you have a healthy business relationship with your customers, as in you're close with your customers, you know what's going on in the customer's world, how they perceive your uh, service, your quality of service, um, yeah, you, you don't need surveys. You just need to have a very, very close relationship with them in constant communication, knowing their needs and expectations, meeting their needs and expectations. Um, you can just ignore the whole survey. Absolutely. It, it, it can be quite cold, can't it, sending out a survey? It sort of feels like quite a clinical approach and less personal. So really good um, thinking there to build that relationship. Diane, what are your thoughts? And then we'll hear from Matt. So You can use both the traditional with the modern approach. So the traditional approach of simply calling someone on the phone and asking them can always work or a modern approach where you can continuously monitor your social media fora, where you can get very insightful information about your customers and their feedback about your products and service. All right, excellent idea. Thank you very much. And I guess you could probably weave that into your day-to-day conversations with clients and just you know, kind of make it more a natural part of the work that you're doing with them. So great idea. Uh, Matt, your thoughts on this? I think that's such a good idea, by the way, about monitoring social feeds, um, increasing, especially for B2C uh, organizations. It's such a good point, Diane. I really like that. A couple from me. One is maybe I'm sounding a bit like a stuck record, but if you ask people at the front line of your business what the service, what they think of the service, they're the ones who are hearing daily from clients about how difficult the system is to use and about you know, the challenges that clients are facing. So often it gets all bundled together in these sort of analytics reports. If it's thousands of customers, you get sort of nondescript data once it goes up the organization. So just ask people at the front line. And I think the second quick thing is when customers give feedback, the extent to which you noticeably react as an organization and you noticeably change something and you highlight that you've changed it because you got customer feedback about it and even cite the individual customer who was so helpful to you in doing it shows that you're the kind of organization that not only wants that feedback, but acts upon it because it's all very well being told something, but if you don't change anything, clients just stop giving you feedback because they just think there's no point. You know, that's such an important thing to show cause and effect. You know, your comment to us has caused us to consider how we're doing this. And actually now we're building a better service delivery because of your import. That's a lovely connection to be able to make. And I, and I think there's nothing better from a customer's perspective to know that they have been influential. And equally so, the other side of the coin is, of course, how impotent do we feel as a customer when we're not listened to, where things never change, where, where we always give up. We give up. 
quite frankly, in trying to shape a better future. So I think that that's really great. And um, I'm a great fan of doing um, uh, analytics, uh, particularly around sentiment. So sentiment analysis is becoming easier and easier to be able to do. There's many services available. So if you're in a large scale organization who is working uh, B2C, then sentiment analysis tools are readily available now and people can use those, of course, but bring them to life with those individual exemplars um, that you want to show on the net promoter spectrum, those clients who really struggled and those clients who are really praiseworthy. Those individual insights are what put the human back into the analytics. And Matt, you wanted to come back with a further thought. Yeah, I was just to say, I, I completely agree with you about sentiment surveys. I, I actually think they're also very relevant in B2B. We started using FIFO. We're a certified B corporation, which obliges us um, to do many really valuable things. One of which um, is to make sure that you are creating opportunities for organizations to feed back in a constructive way. And so we use FIFO, you can use Trustpilot, there's loads, as you say, lots and lots of tools. But I think that we found it to be incredibly value and we are purely B2B. We have no B2C activity at all. And actually, people are just used to it now. We're all used to it, aren't we, providing that sort of sentiment information. I appreciate this is slightly off the topic because the question is how to do it without feedback surveys. But these platforms are so easy to use. It's a single click. It's not a whole survey that takes somebody ages and ages to respond to. I think that you're right. And and th this is where the value comes from the dialogue. You know, social media, um, the, <laughs> the, the correct word is at the front of that. All right. Now, we might be using it to be able to have a one-to-many relationship with individuals who consume a service or interact with a service or add value to a service and so on, or even deliver it. But nonetheless, the heart of the matter is, is that it should be a social experience. It should be listening and responding, a two-way conversation. And it's very difficult to do that if you're not actually getting in there and joining in with the dialogue and the discussion that's taking place online. So great advice. And I completely agree with you, Matt, that the journey, the trend, everything is towards embracing that pioneering work that was done in B2B, uh, sorry, business to consumer rather, and incorporating it into how you work in the B2B space. Excellent. Very good. Charlotte, let's move on. If we can, we'll take our next question. Um, thanks, Nick. We've got a live question um, from Gary, and I think he might be a fan of the show. Um, Gary asks, why do we need a service culture? How does it benefit organisations? And what advice would you give if I'm considering moving more towards it? I can see Matt's okay, well, um <laughs> all, all right. Okay. I, I, I kind of, I can almost hear Gary. I can see Gary actually online. So welcome, uh, Gary, to the uh, to level up today. And uh, Gary's getting his money's worth here, actually, panel, because he's packed three questions inside of one, um, at least. So there we go, Diane. Why don't you start us off with your thinking? Try and unpick at least some of it. All right, and then we'll move on to the rest of the panel. Diane, start us off on this one. So I'll approach the first part of the question of why do we need a service culture? Service culture is important because it leads to excellent customer service. And when your customers are happy, they not only choose to remain with your organization, but also to reference your organization and promote your organization to other customers as well. So you're not only building a, a customer base with your present customers, but potential future customers as well. It's such an important thing, isn't it? It's all about building that future, building a better future, I would say, is most definitely at the heart of the why. Uh, Matt, your thoughts, and then we're going to hear from Mart. I suspect I know which Gary this is, and if it's the one that I think it is, he's um, an expert himself on service cultures. Um, so there's a lot embedded in his question. Um, br briefly, how does it benefit organisations? Well, I think Dan has put it, perfectly the argument has been had and won the ship has uh, long ago left harbor that if you don't provide a decent service no matter what you do whether you're a public service organization or a commercial organization mm. you, you've had it in the end and we've just got countless examples in our history now the bookshelves are full of stories of organizations who had otherwise perfectly serviceable products or solutions but um, suffered a demise because they're 
their service disappeared um, and they lost it. So um, it's it's more than about a benefit. It's about survival in the modern economy. Um, uh, you know, some of us are, are old enough to remember when you know things like USPs existed, where organisations actually didn't have particular competitors. Well, everybody's got competitors now. And your only real differentiation is service, as I suspect Mr. Gary from Northwood knows only too well. In fact, he helps organizations with it on a daily basis. What if I'm considering moving towards it? Well, um, start by baselining where you are. Um, and uh, Melanie and Diane have already given great advice about how to do that. But it's about understanding confidently where your baseline is and being brave enough to ask some really difficult questions. Uh, once you've got that baseline, Everything else that you need to do is is very obvious. Could be very expensive. Could be uh, require an awful lot of effort. Might even require you to change some people. Um, but um, that is the direction you'll need to take if you want to survive long term. It's such an important part, isn't it? You know, as the as the economy around the world has gone from one of continuous growth over the last few years, very low cost of um, uh, borrowing in order to be able to fund investment, um, to a point at which inflation is rising and employment in, invariably tends to follow and variable spend starts to decline. And people now need to secure their future. And as an organisation, Matt is so, so correct. You know, functionality, what you do alone is easily uh, re replicating, re replicated by your competitors. How you do it is an entirely different matter. You can do it fabulously, and therefore, you know, differentiate yourself um, in your in your market from your competitors. Excellent answer. Thank you so much. Um, let's then hear from Mart next, and then Marlene. Uh, just building a little bit on what was said already. I like that famous quote once said. Um, you know, customers are like teeth, ignore them and they will go away. Um, it, it's, it's, it's definitely about making sure that, first of all, that you know what your services are and then build a service mindset around that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a given that nine out of 10 organizations are in, uh, in the service industry, but it's sometimes embarrassing to see how few actually know what ser the services are they, uh, they are delivering. They're not defined mm -hmm. and it's just as in we do. Um, so how difficult it will be then to have a service mindset if you don't know what your customers are or what your services are. Um, so I would st start there and build on that. Excellent. Thank you very much. You did get that, get that clear in your organization and clarity, um, really does help get everybody aligned. I'm convinced about that. Very good. Uh, Marlene, final thoughts on this one? Uh, I was actually going to say exactly what Matt said. You, you know, you need to have an understanding of what your services actually are. And I find a lot of organizations don't seem to have a, a grip or, or, a, or a complete view on their services. And also don't assume that the services that you have already defined and you, you're delivering are actually uh, the right ones. You know, uh, it's a good idea to use this opportunity to revisit, uh, you know, where there might be gaps in your in your service offerings themselves, what you might need to do differently, as well as how you go about actually delivering those services. Excellent. Thank you very much. Indeed. We've got some great answers here. And thank you very much uh, to Gary for uh, stacking up that question, that set of questions actually for us. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed, um, Dr. Abradou. Uh, lovely to have you online joining us from uh, the Gulf. And also we've got uh, Idara um, joining from Abuja in Nigeria. Um, great city, Abuja, and really lovely to have you online, Idara. And, uh, and Gwathi as well, okay, joining us from the Cameroon. Um, really great uh, to have you online um, today. And I'm hoping that you're getting good value from this discussion around service management, service culture, and really helping you to develop your careers. Um, Umar, lovely uh, to have you online. Um, great, my friend, very much welcome to you to the show. All right, very good. Well, let's move on if we can, I think. And, uh, oh, fantastic. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Jimo, as well. Um, kind of commenting there on the discussion 
around uh, culture, relationships, and service management. It's really fantastic. And uh, already, I think our audience panel are seeing the benefit of you sharing your insight. So Nicholas, picking up there on Marlene's thoughts and comments. Very good. Let's move on. As the questions are stacking up in front of us, Charlotte, let's take the next one, if we may. Thanks, Nick. We've got a live question next that's been asked on LinkedIn. Um, they ask, good culture or good relationship, which drives which? Okay, this is one of those chicken and egg type things, isn't it? Do relationships beget the culture of an organisation or does culture form the relationships in organisations, I guess? You know, it's that kind of thinking really, isn't it? Where do you begin with this? I would suggest, you know, if you're thinking about this, that um, invariably re relationships are at the bottom of this. They are the bedrock of any culture within an organization or indeed outside of organizations in a society. If you have respect in relationships, if you have mutual interest in relationships, if you are a builder rather than a breaker, then generally that will manifest itself at a higher level where you can observe those traits taking place in more than one person. So I would say the relationship could be your starting point and then the culture will be an observable set of behaviours on top of that. Um, Mart, where do you begin with your clients? Do you begin with the culture or do you begin with the relationships? Uh, let me be the consultant. It depends. No. Um, <laughs> So I still strongly believe in what um, Tony, she was uh, trying, trying to tell us, uh, the CEO of Zappos, who said, you know, put the right culture in place and everything else will fall into place. And that's where he started and that's what made him successful. And I still think that um, it's a recipe uh, to success, uh, for success. Uh, relationships, of course, are a major component there. Um, but I would start with the culture, define the culture, and that will, uh, you know, drive a lot of uh, behaviors and that will drive, uh, you know, all the, ser the service quality and anything that comes with that as far as uh, the organization's results and success. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Diane, your thoughts? So in building a good relationship with your customers, the culture of the organization will also be factored in. So I would think it's more of like a merging of the two. All right. Okay. So it's kind of that blend and separating one from the other may be a little bit more tricky than you perhaps might think. So uh, if you can try not to think too much sequentially and think more about the value that one will bring um, to the next. Um, Matt, you've worked with a lot of organisations, often like March, you're kind of introduced at the C-suite, but where do you begin? Do you begin from the ground up, from the building blocks, or do you begin from the top down? Uh, well, I think you know that my answer to the first question indicates my uh, my prejudice in this area, which is um, if you don't do the top down work, then you know the bottom up doesn't work. You, you've got to take seriously the information that you're getting bottom up, and that is often quite difficult for executives because it feels just like everybody's moaning the whole time, and so you sort of get into this. Oh God, you know everybody's complaining about the system and the the engineers or the branches or any all that kind of stuff and it just feels like this sort of, I know I've sat in the exec rooms as a, as a exec leader and it feels like this sort of constant barrage and then you're sort of remembered well that's why I'm paid a bit more than other people is to deal with this stuff I do think it's quite a bit about how organizations react to this kind of information though and there's a brilliant I know you like some book recommendations there's a great book that some people not, might know called thanks for the feedback it's by Douglas Stone and Sheila Heen it's a brilliant book because on the front of the cover it's got lots of feedback about the cover like wrong font you know too big too so it's quite funny uh, and, it, and it's based on the premise that we've spent a lot of time teaching people how to give feedback but precious little teaching people how to receive it and i think that's especially true of execs so yeah i think from an exact point of view that that's the that's the answer to, to go back to the question i'm very binary on this though it's good relationships um you can scribble cultures on a wall you can have mouse mats and posters all you like you can tell people how terribly important it is but if you haven't got decent relationships to begin with between people internally it's often about how functions are interacting with each other 
sometimes they're just genuinely poisonous internal relationships. You can sort of tell, can't you? You know, when you phone in as a consumer and somebody says, oh, I need to put you through to another department and you go through, and they sort of tell you they're going to brief the other department on your call. And then somebody randomly picks up the phone and sort of says, hello, what do you want? And you think, yeah, I haven't told them, told me anything. They just hate each other. So it's just like, oh, we need to get this off my, off my area and into somebody else's. So a lot of it is Absolutely. just about internal relationships. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love that. It doesn't matter how many mouse mats that you have. Absolutely right. Spot on. Uh, Marlene, what are, what are your thoughts from um, a relationship management perspective? I'm thinking about uh, the theory of relationshipism, you know, that the BRM Institute has developed in, in the last couple of years, around which the, our BRMP and, and CBRM courses are um, structured. And uh, it really is, uh, you know, looking at the organization, um, you know, from a relationship-centric perspective. And once we actually focus on relationships and we set up conditions for good relationships, then other things will follow, you know, such as a focus on, on value, uh, building of partnerships, you know, evolving culture and, and so on. So I actually concur with you, Nick, that relationships are the bedrock upon which we build uh, everything else in the organization. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, let's go to Mart for your final thoughts on this one, and then we'll move on. I just want to add, I think to add just what uh, Malini said, that um, all those components she mentioned from the BRM capability as the BRM Institute has put, it, has put forward um, is the uh, fact that it all comes, also comes down to driving uh, sorry, satisfying purpose, and then what are we aiming for as an organization? Um, and then you uh, supplement that with uh, building partnerships and uh, evolving culture and driving value. Uh, so it's as in they all come at the same time. It's it's certainly true. One of one organization that I worked with many many years ago, so they were preparing for competition from being a monopoly supplier were very challenged by the concept of the customer. Um, they had a, a peculiarly internal view. And it took quite a long time, actually, of being in a competitive environment for that uh, utility organization to really embrace what a relationship was with customers. Because what they imagined was a relationship was very one-sided, and we all know how those relationships end. <laughs> Not, not generally in a celebration, is it? So it can take time, and it depends where you're starting from, I would say. But thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Bondimo, I think it is, um, for your question, my friend, because it's such an important step, isn't it? Where do we begin with this? You know, Is it top-down? Is it bottom-up? But we all have a role to play, and you can do this today yourself, how we behave um, in our day-to-day -day work influences hugely what the outcomes are with our colleagues, with our customers, um, for our organisation. So really great question. Thank you very much indeed. Charlotte, let's move on, please. We'll take our next question, if we may. Thanks, Nick. We've got a question from Dr. Nabib. Um, Nabil, sorry, I do apologise. How do we reconcile tradition and culture in the acceleration we are witnessing in the future world? It's quite an important thing, this, isn't it? Everything is changing so quickly, and the pace of change seems to be um, accelerating at all times. So how do we manage to, to ensure our heritage of our tradition, if we can call it that, is not just abandoned in this kind of race in order to be able to kind of keep up. Um, Diane, why don't you start us off from a public sector perspective, and then we'll hear from Matt. So traditions and cultures are embedded in the value statement, your mission, vision, strategic goals of the organization. So although things are rapidly changing in our society, once you have the groundwork of what exactly the service that you're offering and your service culture, irrespective of how quickly things are changing, you would still be grounded in your customer service. 
It's such an important thing, isn't it, to acknowledge heritage and to acknowledge tradition and ensure that you know that you keep the very best of that, um, because otherwise you lose your identity somehow or another. Um, Matt, what are your thoughts on this, on tradition and culture and pace of change? It, it's a fascinating question, isn't it? Because it sort of implies that somehow there's a a sort of friction, a, a contradiction between tradition and culture. And, and I'm, I'm really not sure that there is. I actually think um, both consumers and businesses can sniff out now an organisation that's faking it and that actually it's not real for them. And so I think there's a huge place for being very proud of your heritage as an organization. Uh, and I think, you know, as much as we're all buying from organizations that's the new and sort of sexiest organization, I mean, the, the, the economically, you know, we're now seeing the return of value stocks, you know, where actually share prices of organizations that have been around for, uh, you know, 20, 50, 100 years are actually now doing a bit better than the sort of, you know, latest, greatest company that's managed to lose 50 billion and generate next to nothing in terms of, you know, economic value. Uh, and so I, I'm, I sort of want to challenge the premise of it a little bit, because I think, I think buyers are smarter than that. And if you're faking it, they're going to know. My, my favorite example culturally is always Johnson & Johnson. Who I just think, you know, as an, I mean, it's a consumer-oriented organization, of course, you know, they've had the same set of values, I think now for something like 80 years. And so instead of messing about with them every few years, instead of you know, hiring, you know, some dumb consultant like me to come and write a new set of words, they just stick with the ones that they've got and embed them deeply in their day to day. I think they believe passionately in tradition um, and, and passionately in standing up for the culture that they've got as an organisation. I think it's as relevant in the future world as it was in the past one. Mm, it's a really good point, isn't it? I think as we look back, um, uh, later in our careers, um, there is, to a certain extent, um, a bit of a, 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 a tinted lens that we can look back on and say, oh, you know, things were better when, and then you've kind of fill in the blank that follows that statement. Um, but there, are, to your point, Gary, the, there's a certain degree of authenticity required from all organisations in order to be credible in the new world order. Now you can change how you deliver um, that service. You can create opportunities for people to engage with you in a self-service fashion, to carry out transactions um, at their own pace and in their own time um, when it's more convenient for them. But to, to, to abandon the ability for that person to have a human to human dialogue and conversation is a mistake because that may actually break the very tradition or the very value, the very heritage that, that you have built your business upon, which is really important. Uh, Marlene, final thoughts on this. Um, something came up in my social media feed today, right? Uh, um, which I think is, is is relevant to this idea of tradition and, and uh, accelerating change. And that is, uh, it's a little clip about Japanese fans at the FIFA World Cup matches and how they always clean up the stands after them, right? Uh, and I don't know if you've seen it. If you haven't, please uh, look for it on YouTube. It's actually quite interesting because they interview these Japanese fans and they, they explain how this is just part of their uh, culture and tradition. And so they learn it from school from when they're in school and they apply it to all aspects of their life, even when they go to something which is reputed for its rowdiness. You know, how, how much rowdier can it get other than a, than a soccer match? But they still bring their tradition and they, they um, you know, apply it so beautifully. So I think, uh, you know, we can find, as Diane said, find those things that are of value, but find new ways to, you know, manifest them. Culture, as Mark, uh, you know, so beautifully expressed earlier, it's it's and if it's an evolving thing. Yeah, 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 and and it is a, a really, really great um, example that one, um, Marlene. So thank you very much indeed. You can kind of see, you know, somebody's culture in action. It's the behaviour, you know, it's that that expression, isn't it? An expression of values um, is genuinely what a culture is all about. So thank you very much indeed, um, Charlotte. We're running out of time, so we're going to need to move at some pace. Panel, let's press on. Next question, please. 
Thanks, Nick. We've got a question from Scott, a live question. How can we ensure that all service management requirements have been captured and mapped to delivery? Sometimes customers are not sure what they need. Mm, there's a lot of commentary around this, isn't there, about creating you know, service management and delivery uh, standards and applying them in real life. Customers don't always know what they want. And in fact, I think it was Steve Jobs um, who said that it wasn't the customer's, uh, wasn't the customer's uh, uh, responsibility <laughs> you know, to, to know exactly what they want. Um, Mart, you work a lot in this space. Um, do you agree? Well, I never would aim for knowing all the service management requirements. Good luck with that. Um, and uh, so I would also uh, comment on this question as in it sounds a little bit like um, react, re- a reactive mode here going on as in wait and see. Um, I would say uh, turn it around and instead of uh, waiting for the requirements, uh, you know, be ahead of them and uh, think in terms of demand shaping uh, instead of, uh, you know, demand management and uh, waiting for demands to come in and then have to say yes or no. Shape these demands and then the requirements will, uh, of course, follow. But it's it's this uh, pr- more proactive approach that is necessary to uh, meet these requirements that at the very least have to be met and then go for the, uh, the want-to-haves and then the nice-to-haves. Yeah, it's an important thing, isn't it? And particularly in an agile environment, you're not necessarily going to be able to write everything down before you launch your service delivery. You're going to have to do it on the fly. So um, be happy enough to start from where you are and then add to it over time. Marlene, final thoughts? Uh, I agree with Mart. I think uh, we should not be you know, aiming or aspiring to capture all requirements. Uh, you could also, you know, there are fabulous methodologies available these days where you can actually uh, build to understand rather than trying to understand and then build, right? So uh, you might come up with um, some wireframes or prototypes uh, and use that to elicit more requirements. Uh, so I would I would suggest think about how, as Mart said, how we can flip that. Excellent idea. I love that um, phrasing as well, build to understand rather than understanding their build. It's certainly part of our daily lives now, I think. It's uh, absolutely true. So thank you very much, Marlene. And thank you, um, Scott, for your brilliant question. Um, let's move on, Charlotte. We'll try and pack them in. Uh, next question, please. Um, we've got a question from Miles um, Charman, um, live on LinkedIn, and I don't want to tempt the panel with their answers. Um, beyond ITIL, do you know Framewitch who can help developing and implementing a culture aligned with business objectives? Marlene, stop us off and then we'll hear from Matt. Uh, Miles, great question. Um, so uh, I have two suggestions. One is, of course, the business relationship management framework from the uh, BRM Institute. Um, it, it has a lot of components. It addresses a lot of components that we discussed today, relating to, to culture, which you might find interesting. I'd also encourage you to look beyond um, IT and service management uh, and look at disciplines like, for example, human-centered service design. There's a lot that we can learn from that. Uh, that you might uh, find useful. And I'll recommend a couple of books um, that we can put up in the chat afterwards for you to read. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Marlene. Great, great thoughts thoughts there. Uh, Matt, um, what would you recommend? Uh, Nick, I suspect you know exactly what I'm going to recommend, uh, which is a, a framework called uh, the Professional Services Professional uh, PSProfessional.com is the website. APMG are the are our um, proud certification partner. It's a different way of looking at this kind of space. It's a more of a sort of middle to bottom up way of helping people who often perhaps have more of a technical orientation to develop an all round attitude to business, um, not just a service mentality, but also their commercial and business personal effectiveness skills. Um, but um, more newer frameworks sometimes provide a fresher look um, at these kinds of things. And, uh, uh, you know, with, um, with all sorts of caveats, PS Professional is definitely one of them. 
Yeah, I would really recommend that. It's got real depth and breadth to it. So you can find yourself in the um, spectrum of roles and responsibilities quite quickly and really focus in on the things that you need to learn. Uh, Mart, final thoughts on this, then we'll move on. Organization development is another uh, practice uh, that I would recommend to look into. There's many organizations uh, that are specialized in this. Lots of books have been written about it. You can you know, become a master, have a master degree in it. So organization development would be another recommendation. Yes, yeah, certainly um, really, really important. The other thing that I would say as well is that, you know, frameworks give you, if you like, um, the map for you to be able to navigate your way through transformational change. But you, you really do need other inputs as well to be able to chart your course effectively and understand and bring your team with you. So um, thank you for the question, Miles. Uh, really great question for you to put to the panel. And um, we'll certainly put many links. In fact, Shanice and Adriana already are doing um, into the social chat for everybody to be able to click through later on. Very good. Um, Charlotte, let's take our next question. Thanks, Nick. We've got a question from James in Yorkshire. Can service culture be developed? Well, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, this one, I would say, James. I was, I was just going to say, yes, my friend. <laughs> yes, it can. Yes, it absolutely can. And should it? Yes, it should. And um, are we committed to it? Well, we should be, actually. Yes. So, <laughs> so there we are. Um, Diane, in all seriousness, though, what would you like to add to, uh, to James's question? Yes, a service culture can be developed initially by hiring the right persons or the right candidates because they will have the right traits to promote the, the culture of the organization. Now, that's a really important part, isn't it? And it's a part of every manager's responsibility and HR partner in a business and um, the C-suite as well to be able to set out what are the kinds of people that you're looking for? What are those human traits that you're wanting to hire into a, an organization? Mm -hmm. You know, it's often said that you can train um, the detail, but you, you have to hire the aptitude in or the, um, the way of thinking, if you like. You have to hire... Um, that uh, raw talent, you know, that's going to make a difference to your business. And the biggest difference that often a manager can make uh, is in hiring better people, and not to be afraid of that, you know, to bring in people who you feel are going to enrich and enhance, you know, the work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, go beyond the present moment, if you like. All right, very good. Excellent. Well, Charlotte, we've got time for one last question, if we're super quick. Um, we do have a live question that's come in, um, Nick, and that question is from Scott. Scott asks, how can we ensure that all service management requirements have been captured and mapped to delivery? Sometimes customers aren't sure what they need. But I think we've had this one already, haven't we? I think we have. I think we have, we have what's yeah. happened here, Scott. What's it's happened here, twice. Scott, is, is, is it's managed to come <laughs> through to twice. us twice. So yeah. we, we will, yeah, we will take that feedback and work on our own service delivery. <laughs> service delivery. It's kind of quite, quite good, really, in a way, isn't it? To kind of highlight in the show, which is driven by questions, the dynamics of getting that one hundred percent right all of the time. So we work very hard at it, but we don't always succeed at it. So thank you, Scott. It was such a good question. It was worth asking twice. Final question, Charlotte. <laughs> Shall we go with David that's on screen? What is service culture and why is it important? So how would you define it then very briefly? Just one or two answers to this um, around what a service culture would be. Uh, go ahead, Matt. I'll have a go. Um, uh, I think service culture is one of those things like very much in business, which is almost impossible to define, but goodness, you know it when you see it. Um, and you know, everybody in the organization who is touching the customer knows. They know. And, and you can run surveys, and we've explored all of that kind of thing over the last hour or so, but people know, and you know it when you feel it. Ask people on the ground is my advice um, uh, about how to find out what your service culture is, but of course it's important. 
You know, it's. Um, I totally agree with that, Matt. Thank you um, very much. As we uh, come back to the panel, um, you know, it's a little bit like I would equate it, you know, to um, my experience with uh, classical music. All right. When I don't always know the name of a particular piece, particularly not, you know, a subsection of a piece of music. But when I hear it played on the radio or I see it um, as being used as the theme tune to a television show or something, I recognize it and it moves me. And there's a certain connection with me that music can make. Now, you may you may not always know the name of the artist or the conductor or the um, lead violinist or whoever is playing, you know, the solo instrument involved, um, but you know that it's right. And service culture is very much like that to Matt's point. Well, marvellous. Well, thank you so much um, to our producers online who have guided us through 60 minutes of incredible conversation on the whole area around developing a service culture, creating and managing, maintaining and improving it. Let's hear our closing remarks now from the panel. Uh, Marlene, if I may, I'll come to you first and then Diane. Um, my, thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, and my, my advice um, to, to everyone who's watching the show, um, you know, making a change or transforming the service culture in any organization can actually seem like a really overwhelming task. And you might also feel that, uh, you know, depending on your position, that you might not be able to do much to have much of an impact. But I will leave you with a quote from the Dalai Lama. If you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I really like that one, Marlene. Thank you so much. Lovely to have uh, the Dalai Lama's thinking as well on Level Up. I feel humbled. You know. um, Diane, um, your thoughts, please. And then we'll hear from Matt. It's a very interesting show with a lot of insightful questions. And I've also learned a lot from the panelists. And today, my takeaway would be from Matt of the terminology of sentiment service. So thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. I agree with you. It's a constant learning opportunity for us. We're in a very privileged position as the Level Up panellists. We get to learn from a lot of very smart people. Matt, your final thoughts, please. And then Mart. Yeah, likewise. Thanks very much, Nick and APMG International. I feel very honoured to be amongst this uh, community. Um, amazing advice. I agree with Diane. My, my single question to everybody to leave you with, my favourite service question is, what are your seven star standards. If you've ever been into a seven star hotel, I've, I've been into the Burj. I've never stayed at the Burj Al Arab and you may have all sorts of opinions about uh, what Dubai is like. Uh, but if you've ever been into one of those environments or indeed ever been somewhere like a Disney park, you know what outstanding customer service is. We, we, you know, most of us that are fortunate to live the lives that we do, we know what outstanding customer service is. The B2C environment has given us countless outstanding examples. And if we think we can get away with it in B2B, we're wrong. We can't. The standards have gone up, and those are the standards. What are your seven star standards? What could you do today that would wow your customer? Because that's what they're looking for. They're constantly looking for a wow. Best wishes to everybody who's taken part in building your service cultures. Yeah, and indeed, and some lovely examples there from you know the incredible feeling of sinking into the carpet. Like you, I've never I've never stayed there, but I did stand in the lobby. <laughs> I did stand in the lobby, but I I didn't I didn't want to stand still for too long. <laughs> For too long, I did feel that I needed to move. I kind of just standing there with your mouth open is not always, you know. They must get a lot of that, though, mustn't they? There, I, I imagine. Anyway, all right. Thank you very much indeed, Matt. Excellent, uh, Mart. Final thoughts for today. Thank you again for having me. Um, I want to finish with uh, what uh, Ron Kaufman was uh, mentioning in his book, Uplifting Service, about what is a service culture. To underline its importance, actually, he said, a service culture is an aspect of the business that fuels and feeds the spirit of every person to create a sustainable advantage, a continuous improvement, and a constant uplifting for people's performance, passion, and potential. There's a lot packed in that one sentence, but is that important? 
Absolutely right. And I, and I think the, the key word out of that for me was about the uplifting of the passion. You know, when, when you're in a, a positive culture, your passion does get uplifted. You feel that you belong and you feel that you're making a difference. And feelings are very important to human beings. They're very important to colleagues. They're very important to customers. So I totally agree with that. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, Mark, rather. And um, Charlotte, your closing remarks for today. Thanks, Nick. It's been a great show. Some great questions from viewers that we didn't manage to ask, but I'm sure we will fit them into another episode. Um, my experience, my career today, I do a lot of service culture. And I think one thing to say is that we need to understand what everybody and what customers need and value for a good service culture. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'd like to thank our panel on everybody's behalf. Thank you so much for your insight and sharing your experience with us all today. Thank you to our producers online. Everybody who's watching is a producer of the show. You determine exactly what we talk about. You put in your questions and we answer them for you. So do watch out for your name in the credits if your question was selected. Over on our website, you can search for the answers to more than 1,500 questions now that have been previously submitted and answered on Level Up and our other events like Midday Mentors and um, Connect and so on, um, from 170 or so experts from all over the world. Uh, don't forget, you can listen to the audio versions as well of the shows on your preferred Podcast, pl podcast platform rather. Friday, what's coming up? Well, um, we're going to jump into the world of innovation and looking at design thinking uh, before helping actually you set out perhaps a little earlier this year, some thoughts for New Year's resolutions on Monday the 5th with a show all about how to secure your future um, in a recession. Um, a little bit further ahead, on Monday the 12th and Friday the 16th, there are two Christmas special shows. So it's an opportunity to get to know the panellists a little bit more and um, get some sneak peeks, if you like, behind the scenes. So please do um, add your questions early for those episodes. Subscribe to the show. We'll send you a personal summary of what's coming up and how you too can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. So thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye now.